Good evening, everybody, and a warm welcome to this year's University of Southampton Public Lecture Series. Our focus for 2018 is on population and migration, and we've just seen a fantastic video uh, presenting the three, uh, connecting the three lectures across the series, and it's the first time I've seen the, the video, so thanks to the, the colleagues at Southampton for putting that together, that looked great. Tonight's inaugural lecture, we're kicking off the series by looking at the costs and benefits of international students. So my name's Professor Jane Falkingham. I'm a member of the university executive at University of Southampton. I'm the Dean of the Faculty of Social Sciences, and I'm also the director for the ESRC Centre for Population Change. And, um, you would have noted that two of the three speakers in the series are actually coming from the center. So tonight's lecture has been live streamed, so welcome to everybody who's viewing over the web. You'll be able to join the panel discussion by tweeting your questions using the hashtag hash UOS lectures, and we'll be monitoring this during the panel discussion, and we hope to include as many of your questions as possible. So colleagues will be monitoring the, the, the stream, so if you want to tweet in your questions, please do. And for those in the room who wish to ask questions, we'll have roving mics, and please do wait for a microphone before asking your question so everyone here and online can hear you. Our university photographer is also present, and will be taking photos during the keynotes and also the panel discussion. And if any of you are worried and you don't wish to be captured on photo, please just identify someone from the University of Southampton, let us know, and we will make sure that none of the photos, including you, are used. Uh, I hope our panel, panelists are happy to be photographed, <laughs> however, otherwise we'd be in a little bit of trouble. Uh, some housekeeping rules. If the fire alarms sound during the presentations, it's not a drill. We're not expecting a fire drill this evening. And so please do exit by one of the doors at the back or at the sides. And um, staff from the building will then be on hand to direct us out of, the, out of the building and to the muster point. So I think that's the housekeeping done. And so now on to the program itself. Southampton is a world leader in population and migration research. And as I've already mentioned, we host the Economic and Social Research Council funded Centre for Population Change. And our experts are also part of the UK government's Migration Advisory Committee. We bring together almost uniquely, I believe, expertise in demography, economics, statistics, social policy, geography, and I can go on naming all of the social science disciplines, uh, to provide new insights into migration and population change. And tonight we'll be hearing some of the latest research from the centre into the costs and benefits of migration into the UK. So tonight we'll be focusing on international student migration and their implications for society and the economy. And these will include uh, some of the findings from the recent Migration Advisory Committee report and also the results of a large-scale survey completed by our team at Southampton to inform this work. So tonight we'll hear from three experts who will each deliver a keynote and this will then be followed by a panel discussion. So we won't be taking questions after each talk. We'll go through each talk and then we'll move to the panel discussion. And our keynote speakers tonight are Professor Alan Manning, uh, Jonathan Chaloff, and from the University of Southampton, Professor Jacko Waba. And I'll introduce each of them in turn before their keynotes. So we're going to be kicked off by Professor Alan Manning, who will deliver his keynote on the impact of international students in the UK. Alan is a professor of economics at the London School of Economics and director of the Centre for Economic Performance's research programme on community. From 2009 to 2012, he was head of the economics department at LSE and from 2004 to 2011, he was a member of the NHS pay review body. He's an expert on labour markets, including the impact of migration. He was a former member of the Migration Advisory Committee and is now the chair of the MAC. So I can think of no better person than to kick us off tonight. So welcome, Professor Manning. Um, 
Um, thank you very much, um, Jane. Um, OK, so I'm going to, in my talk, um, summarise uh, the report that um, the Migration Advisory Committee um, published a month ago now on the impact of international students in the UK and the recommendations that we made for um, changes to the existing uh, system. So I think I should start, many of you may know this, but for those of you who don't, who actually, what, what actually is the MAC? So we were established in 2007. We're a sort of non-departmental public body in UK government jargon, uh, which is appointed by government but independent from government. And our role is to provide evidence-based advice to the government on immigration issues. The government gives us what we call commissions, essentially questions on migration-related issues, and the, we then uh, try and answer those questions. Uh, we make uh, recommendations to the government, um, but ultimately it's the government that makes all decisions and we've always respected that that's their right. So in the past they've accepted most, though not all MAC recommendations, um, but if they don't accept our recommendations we sort of just move on. We recognise it's their right, ultimately it's the government's right to decide. I'm the current chair of, of, of that um, committee, um, but we've got... Um, uh, itself, um, other immigration and labour market experts. Jackie is one of the um, other members, and we're supported by a sort of secretariat of economists, researchers, and policy uh, officials. Um, now, a bit over a year ago, we were asked to, um, we were given a commission on international students. We were asked to uh, provide an assessment of what the impact of international students in the UK has been, uh, to how that impact varied across the type of student, where in the country, the type of course, the impacts while they were students, when they stopped being students, and so on and so forth. Um, and, you know, and then from that to make recommendations on how the student migration system should um, operate. Um, so we tend to, our, every, when we're ev we think of ourselves as an evidence-based body, that means the evidence gathers a wide variety of evidence. So we generally, in all commissions, issue a call for evidence. For this one, we received over 140 written uh, responses. We have a whole series of meetings with stakeholders. And we also do um, our own sort of in-house analysis um, uh, and, and research. Um, so I'll start with sort of some background on um, international students in, in the UK, which is, I think, useful context. So this figure here gives you, um, these are the number of student visas issued um, to um, non-EU students. Now, EU students at the moment coming into the UK to study don't require any visa, so these are student visas issued by the UK uh, government. Um, and it also shows um, the measure that comes from the UK's International Passenger Survey of non-EU long-term immigration to study. So this is a different sort of information on student immigration. But as you can see, the, although the, these different measures are, are slightly different, they all follow similar trends and got to tell a similar kind of story. And that story is really one of sort of underlying long-term underlying kind of growth slow but sort of steady um, but with an extraordinary boom and bust that happened in sort of late from sort of 2008 through to 2012 and you know if you want to know well what was going on in that boom and bust um, basically that was all happening within the further education sector and in among English language schools so basically they're crudely four types of institutions which are issuing student visas. There's higher education, you're probably mostly from universities, that's that sector. There's further education, um, there are international schools, so this would be school-aged children, boarding schools and so on, and then there are English language um, schools. And um, higher education has had sort of steady growth, more or less, through this period. Didn't really have much of a boom and bust. As student numbers there have grown by 25% since 2010. But further education, there's a fall of 78% since 2010. English language schools, 79%. So all of that boom and bust is really happening outside the um, HE, um, HE sector. Now, the quality of data on the HE sector is much, much better 
The HE sector is much better organised than these other sectors. And so a lot of the report and the data and so on focuses on the HE sector and, and the reports today. Um, but one of the things that we sort of struggled a bit in this report to do is, for example, to engage uh, with, with the FE um, sector. OK, so this is a picture of the, the, that was all about inflows. This is about the sort of stocks of uh, international students in higher education. So here we're dividing this up into sort of EU and non-EU um, by um, the sort of level of education. So first degree, um, other undergraduate, we just think of those as other first degree, but technically they're not quite the same. Postgraduate taught, so these are like master's students, and um, postgraduate research. And what you can see there is that, um, you know, non-EU, and then we've also got the split by UK, non-EU, and EU for those three big groups, undergraduate, um, postgraduate taught, and postgraduate research down here. Um, and what you can see is that undergraduates very heavily dominated by UK students, non-EU students twice as important as EU students. When you go to postgraduate taught, uh, non-EU students, be, you know, international students becoming much more important and non-EU students even more important relative to EU. And then when you go back to sort of postgraduate research, PhD, again, an even higher proportion of international students and a, a markedly higher proportion of, of, of EU students. Um, so that's sort of what's happening in the UK. Now, you might be interested in what is happen, happening in the sort of wider international context. We know that the market for international students is a very competitive one, an increasingly competitive one. And so um, we might want to know, well, how is the UK doing in that, that case? And so this represents the market share of um, the UK in, um, you know, in the, the total world market. Uh, UK historically and still to this day is the second most popular destination for international students after, um, after the US. Um, Australia is sort of catching up in recent years. Some people say Australia might overtake the UK in a year or two. We haven't quite seen that. I'm not sure whether that will quite happen. We'll see. Um, but I think when you look at this picture, um, what you can see is that actually over a relatively long period of time, um, the market share of the UK has not really changed that much. Now, there has been a slight decline in the last four or five years. So I think the way in which we summarise that is that there's no, there are no grounds for complacency in the UK. But the, um, some of the reports that you would read which sort of present, present a position of panic um, are just don't, don't really stand up to scrutiny. So sometimes people would say, well, this country in this year grew by 12% and this in the UK in this year you know, went down by this. But those are not really, you know, they're a little bit cherry picking on the numbers that people are quoting. And so the overall picture is really probably much more of underlying, um, underlying stability. Um, but a slight downward movement in recent years. That has, hides quite different pictures by different uh, students from different countries. So the Chinese market, which is growing very rapidly, is the single biggest source of international students in the UK now by some very considerable margin. Um, the UK has actually done pretty well in keeping the market share of total um, um, international students. But the market share of students from India has fallen uh, quite dramatically. And it's perhaps just hit the bottom and come back a little bit um, now. But, um, you know, a lot of, um, there's a certain amount of discussion, a lot of people express concern about what was happening um, in the market for Indian students. Um, okay, so we... Um, did a study of you know, the impact of students uh, while studying, and I'll just sort of have a very quick, high-level uh, run-through of this. Um, the bottom line is that they provide a clear economic benefit to the UK. Uh, that comes through you know, the tuition fees that they pay, through the money they spend on their the living, living expenses. Friends and families come to visit them in the UK, and so on. Um, they clearly benefit the institutions where they study. They're typically paying higher fees than other students. They're cross-subsidising the education of domestic students. They're making some courses 
viable that wouldn't otherwise be viable. They're cross-subsidizing uh, research. Um, they benefit the local areas where they study. Um, there are many parts of the UK where the uh, university would be the single biggest employer in the local economy. Um, and you know that then the, the, and they're providing often the universities are providing highly pa high paid high quality jobs not everyone in the university sector thinks of themselves as high paid always uh, but relative to many jobs they uh, they are um, uh, we and they also uh, benefit uh, the public uh, finances I and mean, we see students on the whole are not paying income tax but when they spend money in the local community they're paying VAT and things like this and they're really not much then they're not el eligible for welfare benefits and their um, demands on the NHS because they tend to be young and healthy are pretty low um, so um, we also kind of looked at the impact that what domestic students felt about um, studying alongside international students and those views are generally um, positive there are some people who express negative views which were mostly around language issues um, feeling that sometimes there were, you know international students English language sort of held things back a bit um, we also tried to look although it's hard to do about ev any evidence of uh, international students on the wider communities in which they're living although it's hard here to distinguish often between the impact of international students and students more generally. But there are some neighbourhoods, probably in Southampton, that are very heavily dominated by students, and that comes to alter the, the character of those neighbourhoods. But again, we didn't find any evidence that that affected adversely amenities and offer, or actually how people who are non-students in those neighbourhoods feel about their neighbourhood. Um, we kind of also looked at um, the impact of students post-study. Some of those students stay um, to work in the UK. Obviously, if you're an EU student, we don't have much information about this because you don't have a visa. There's sort of no trace of this, really, in the data that we have. But for non-EU students, you have approximately 6,000 a, a year moving to a, a work visa. This is, and these are by those work visas pretty much have to be all in skilled work. They're mostly moving into STEM-related or business-related jobs. Um, they tend to come from research, into, they're much more likely to come from research-intensive institutions, though not all of them do. Um, and also, there's also impact of students um, who leave the UK after study. One hopes that they leave the UK with a relatively positive view of the UK and they've established links and so on, and so they then, um, perhaps there are future um, economic links between uh, themselves and the UK. Um, perhaps people talk about soft power. Again, quite hard to quantify, but almost certainly um, positive. Um, and so in terms of how, where all that analysis leads to in terms of recommendations, um, international students are beneficial important source of skilled workers for the UK economy and so they should have the opportunity to move into skilled work and a reasonable amount of time to find that work. And those broad principles basically form the basis for our recommendations. Um, th those recommendations, I'll just run through them a bit, so that there, no cap, there should be no cap on the numbers of international students. There isn't a cap now. Actually, the government has been fairly clear about saying it's not going to introduce a cap. Not everyone in the sector that we came across believed the government, it should be said, on, on, on that, uh, and so on. And sometimes where the government were and where the sector were seemed to us to not really be in the same place. And actually, it's quite important that they work together to grow the number of international students. And we thought that it should be made easier to enter into skilled work post-study. Um, we didn't think that there should be changes on rules of work while studying and the rights to bring dependents. Um, and so on. Actually, this is not quite the right version. There's an edited version. It's more or less the same, though, because I noticed there was some duplication there. Post-study, to make things easier to get into um, work, uh, skilled work, we thought the um, leave period to remain, automatic leave period to remain uh, for master's students should be extended from four to six months in line with, there's a pilot to do that at the moment. Uh, that PhD students should have an automatic right to remain for 12, year, 12 months after completion, which now currently they have to apply for and pay extra visa fees for. Um, and we also th recommended that um, people who've studied in the UK, um, at the moment, if you move from being a student to a worker in the, in the UK, 
If you do that while remaining physically in the UK, you have certain advantages over if you applied from outside the country. And we recommended that that advantage should be tied to being a graduate of, of the institution. We recommended two years post-graduation and not tied to being physically present in the UK as it is at, at the moment. So people could leave the country for a while and then apply with the same advantages um, um, you know, for, two, for a number of years after completion. But although we did go, that is in the direction of liberalising things, there are two issues that I, I should talk about that were raised by uh, stakeholders in the sector uh, where we did not go as far as the sector would have liked to have, us to have done. And one of these is removing students from the net migration statistics or target uh, where we didn't re recommend any uh, change. And most of the sector wanted to have a, a post-study work visa of something like one to two years with unrestricted work rights in that period. And we didn't recommend that. So I'll just explain why we didn't quite go down that route. First of all, students in the net migration statistics, there is no case for taking them out of the statistics. Those statistics are you know, an internationally agreed uh, definition, they're used for population estimates that are then used for a whole range of planning purposes. You would mess up a huge amount of stuff if you took them out of the st statistics. But you might think about taking them out of, out of the target. Um, um, but the problem is that that's very difficult because we have poor estimates of um, student emigration. We have pretty good estimates of student immigration, terrible measures of student emigration. And, you know, you would have to do really quite a lot of work to make this happen. Although a lot of people said they wanted us to take them out, it was striking that nobody told us how to do it, which is quite revealing, I think. Um, and, um, and we did an illustrative exercise of what it would look like if you did remove them from the net migration statistics. And the bottom line is it makes very little difference because most students, you know, they, they, they come in and then they go out. And so they contribute in the longer run nothing to net migration. The ones who stay, become a worker or something, they do contribute to net migration, but you have to count them then. They're no longer students. They're some other kind of migrant. So we did a little um, exercise about, which is very back of the envelope, um, if you do these kind of, uh, do some kind of adjustment, what, do the, what would the net migration statistics look like? And the answer is those two lines look pretty much exactly the same. It would make no difference to the actual measured levels of net migration if you took net migration statistics out, and doing so would require a huge amount of work. So we, didn't, we think there's much better things for statisticians to be working on than that particular issue. The post-study work visa, um, we didn't recommend a separate visa, although we do recommend being more liberal on automatic leave to remain. The, one of the main reasons we do that is that we were concerned that uh, many non-EU graduates, especially gr master's students, seem to end up working not in skilled jobs, in extremely poorly paid jobs. And we think it is important that graduates who remain in the UK have an opportunity to go into skilled work, but it has to be skilled work, appropriate to what we think their qualifications are. And this is this kind of um, statistic um, here. So here is a sort of, this is... Um, one year after graduation, these are sort of annualised salaries, and um, kind of what you can see, I mean, the most striking thing here is that 25% of non-EU um, master's graduates are, in the subsequent year, earning a salary that's essentially the minimum wage. And, um, you know, that makes us think that this image, an image of them of all being very, very talented, um, you know, in high skilled work is not accurate and we, so we thought longer periods to remain would probably not lead to much more in the way of skilled workers. Um, it's even more extreme when you go to MBA graduates who you might think are people who are really interested in making money. I mean there the gaps are really astound, astoundingly big. Um, so just to conclude very quickly, I think I'm on time. Um, you know, education is a comparative advantage of the UK. We have a long tradition of having high quality institutions and we have the advantage of the English language and that has, you know, meant that we've, it's a very strong a sector in which the UK is very strong. Um, 
uh, but it is an increasingly competitive sector. There are no grounds for complacency, but I think also there are no, not the reasons for panic that some people sometimes talk about. But we do think that the, it's important that you build the demand for UK education around the quality of the education that's being offered and a reasonable opportunity to move into skilled work, not just any work, in, into skilled work. And those are the sort of principles around which we made our recommendations. So thank you. Thank you, Alan. Gosh, it's going to be hard to wait with all those questions, isn't it? I've already got some in my head that I want to ask. But I'm now delighted to turn to our, our second speaker, Jonathan Chaloff, who will deliver his keynote, Changing International Student Migration Flows, Policy Trends and Underlying Assumptions Regarding Costs and Benefits. Jonathan is a comparative migration policy expert at the International Migration Division of the Directorate of the of for Employment, Labour and Social Affairs for the OECD. He's co-authored numerous papers and reports. I had a quick look at his um, profile this morning. I was so impressed with uh, the number of papers, mainly focusing on, on individual countries, but also bringing together experiences from across countries. And a recent report focused on managing labour migration smart policies to support economic growth, which is, I think, what we're all interested in. He's worked directly with many governments to provide policy evaluation, support and consulting for over 20 years. So, Jonathan, welcome. So, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Southampton, for the invitation. Uh, this is an issue that uh, many OECD countries are extremely interested in. And as we uh, work with countries and do reviews, it's always one of the main questions about the labor migration system. What is the role uh, of international study? And that generally reveals a number of assumptions about uh, what are the costs and benefits uh, of international study. So uh, I'm going to present some of the data on the flows and on the stocks uh, and what we've learned about international uh, students and their transition uh, from study to employment. Uh, in the international comparison. So I'll just start with an overview of trends in the flows and stocks, uh, look at some of the policy directions that countries are moving in admission uh, for work during study and what happens afterwards, and the relationship between international study and uh, work and other channels for economic migration. So uh, as, as I think you've also seen in the presentation uh, by Alan, there have been, uh, there's been a steady increase in the number of people leaving to study abroad. And if you just look at OECD countries, the permits, so these are inflows on a permit basis to OECD countries. You can see that even with the, uh, the economic crisis in 2008, where most channels of migration fell, international study was increasing. What has changed a bit uh, is the destination the, the countries of the, the countries of destination and some call it market share. I mean, if in the industry, it's the country has a market share. The UK, as Alan was saying, has a market share that's that's been uh, holding. Um, it's slightly slightly decreasing, but for other countries, the increase has been much sharper in their market share. So, uh, you, it's countries like Japan and Canada have been very successful in expanding their intake and. Uh, Countries which have a smaller number of uh, inflows have also seen a big growth. So that there are far more actors now in the international uh, study marketplace than there were 15 or 20 years ago when there were just a few countries that were taking most international students. Uh, even so, the U.S. Uh, really dominates the, the, the market, although the, the share is declining. And you can see here a very sharp decline from 2015. and this, from what we can see from the early signs, it's continuing now in 2017. The stock hasn't, hasn't fallen as much because more of these, these people are staying for longer periods. The study period is longer, but their, their share, share is declining. Are people going somewhere else? It's not really clear where, if they are, uh, or whether these are programs like the program in Saudi Arabia and Brazil to send students abroad, which have been uh, have sharply diminished. So there's so many different factors driving uh, comparative market share that it's, it's difficult to, 
to just base it on uh, the, the idea that all countries are going to be uh, benefiting from an increasing number of international students. Uh, this, you can't read the, the pie here, but uh, the red is the United Kingdom. Uh, then uh, Australia is the next blue one, Japan, Canada, and, and other countries. So this is the most recent flow data that we have from permits. A few origin countries dominate. Uh, you have China is by far the largest single uh, sending country, and it continues to increase. So the Chinese still have an enormous potential for sending students to study abroad. And many of these go back to China, so that even within China, the higher education sector has been affected by this, this return. More than half of the students who go abroad come back from the Chinese statistics. So, uh, this, you can imagine, has, has a, large, uh, a large impact on, uh, on the Chinese higher education sector, on who's working in Chinese universities, most of them, uh, you have large, large number of people coming back from abroad. India, much smaller, and so on. And in some European countries uh, mostly send students within Europe. Uh, Asia is the largest single origin. That's not changing. Uh, just briefly, when you do look at these, these main countries, you can see that the origin country is very different also from one destination to another. China is the main country of origin for almost all OECD countries, although within Europe, Germany and France, they draw up far more international students from other origin countries. Uh, for historical reasons, for France, uh, from Francophone countries, uh, and for Germany, they attract very many uh, Russians and uh, other people. Europeans largely. So where have the policy trends uh, been going? So the first is that uh, historically international study in many countries was seen as a form of overseas development assistance. And even now there are many OECD countries which consider all scholarships for international students as a form of OD ODA and actually report it as ODA, even though the expenditures are all in the country, even if that person doesn't go back home. So in the past, especially the countries, uh, Europe, many continental European countries, the idea was that these people would come, study, and go back home, and this was a form of development assistance. It wasn't about uh, supporting the higher education sector. It wasn't about uh, export. So that's changed. Even those countries which still have a strong commitment have change the way they think about international study and it's seen uh, in, in the, as, a, um, as, as an exporter. The second is that more and more countries have decided to increase the number of international students through different policy measures and set targets. So in the UK, I think you're well aware of the policy risk of setting an explicit target. Uh, but, and it, this has happened in, in a number of countries with international students that the government has declared our target is to set, we want 300,000, so Japan said 300,000 students by 2020, they didn't reach it. In Korea, the objective was to uh, reach 50,000 by 2012, which they did, and now they set a target of 200,000. Also in Malaysia, even China, have these very ambitious targets to increase the number of international students, and so put in place policies, outreach, uh, encourage universities to go abroad, change the language of instruction, so very, uh, aggressive state-led uh, proposals to, to, to do this. And there are a few reasons for this. One is it's an export industry. Another reason is that uh, these are, they want to internationalize their higher education. They want to bring uh, international professors. They want to participate in circulation of ideas. There's also a, a kind of a perverse effect of the the rankings, the higher education rankings, which take into account the share of international students in enrollment. So it encourage countries that would like to see their universities, their champion universities rise in these international rankings. So one way to do that is to boost an international student enrollment. So there are a number of different factors that are uh, convincing countries to develop these policies. So you, most countries now have websites, study in Sweden, study in Japan, study uh, in Korea with providing information and, and working with universities. And those countries which did have limits on the number of international students have largely done away with them. As, uh, so Italy had a, an old system where they had a cap and they've, they've eliminated it, and there are other examples. 
The third general trend is about restrictions. Uh, that on the one hand, while there's more interest in, in international recruitment, there have been so many episodes of abuse and policies that have gone a bit uh, wrong compared to their objective that there has been more of a, a crackdown on institutions, uh, on courses of study, and on compliance mechanisms. Uh, the, also the choice of courses, the, the link between labor <coughs> migration opportunities afterwards and the choice of training. So for example, uh, when the country allows people with a certain with, with certain training to have priority access to labor migration. In Australia, it was a case where shortage occupations, uh, like accountants, would have priority for migration. Many universities started offering these accountancy courses, and the country was flooded with accountants, and almost all of their labor migrants were accountants and, and hairdressers for a few years. So there are issues with uh, unintended effects. Uh, and that has also led a shift to put more pressure on the institutions themselves as mechanisms for compliance. So institutions have to report whether the student is there, whether they're going to class, whether they're taking the exams, what their exam output is, uh, and some skepticism regarding uh, new universities uh, or universities which have seen a big increase in their enrollment, or, and certainly language schools. Uh, to come back to this question of the export industry, it's interesting to see that the main countries of destination are also the most expensive, and that there's an enormous difference in the cost of international study, and that some of the countries that have very big market share, are, it's not because they're cheaper. As a matter of fact, they're much more expensive. Uh, it's very difficult to do this because there's such a wide range of costs, and many people have scholarships. Uh, but it's interesting to see that the living costs are, are, are what really uh, are the factor in many continental European countries, whereas it's the tuition costs in many of the countries that, uh, where the, the higher education industry is, is driving the, the interest in international study. There's also the question uh, of the language of instruction. So if in some countries, if you study in the national language, there's no tuition. If you study in English, they charge tuition. Uh, and they realize that this is possible exactly for the, the, the reason you can see here, that the education costs can still be competitive. Uh, nonetheless, that's, that's not causing an enormous change. You don't see an enormous flow of people to these low-cost destinations, but they still uh, have this competitive advantage. So how do students pay for this? Uh, they work during study. Uh, this is, just shows the, the, the legal limits, the number of working hours per week that are allowed for international students. Uh, most countries do allow international students to work, sometimes with some conditions. They might have to request authorization. Uh, they, they may be limited to working in certain fields. Overall, I, I, as, uh, as Alan said, there's an impact. There's a positive impact uh, in terms of the, the, the contribution to the labor market, but in some cases, uh, it can be quite concentrated. So it, when we did a review of New Zealand, the number of international students w working in, in Auckland, for example, was about 10% of all youth employment. So at that point, it begins to have an effect uh, also on uh, the, the general youth market for, for residents. Now, that's a particular example because there are a lot of students. But you certainly see, for example, in Japan, the international students in some of the cities uh, are, are dominant in, in, in a lot of service jobs. Uh, so that raises the question is how do you limit n possible negative impact on the labor market uh, if there are a large number of international students and they're all working in very specific sectors like hospitality. Quite often they are less protected by, by labor regulations. So the question is how many stay? This, has, this is really an impossible analysis to do and I really appreciated the work done in the MAC report trying to figure out how many people stay. This is an analysis we did about 10 years ago. It's people who stay for all reasons, work, family, uh, and the range, these, these numbers are not really very reliable, but the range is between 15 and 35%. In the country reviews, this is usually the range that it falls in. Uh, so most international students go home. Many of them do stay, but of those who stay, not all of them stay for work. Many of them get married, especially if they've been in the country for a while, people in university quite often form relationships, get married. So what happens afterwards? Uh, 
there's been a switch from restriction to facilitating this. So most countries do allow international students to change status and remain afterwards. So this, this ban that was in place in many countries in the time of the overseas development aid uh, pers perspective is, has ended. The way they do that varies. Sometimes it's just a simple mechanism, like they're exempted from the labor market test or they're exempted from the cap. Uh, there can be facilitations in access to, to permanent residency or citizenship. Uh, they may have a set-aside quota in a capped program. Uh, but there can also be some ins insistence that the student actually end up working in a field that they studied in. Uh, so for example, in Germany it's a very strict requirement that if you want to stay on after your studies and you graduate, you have to get a job in the exact field that you studied in. So if you're a chemist, you can't go work in IT. You have to be in chemistry. They, uh, in France it's a res fairly restrictive, but not as restrictive, and there are other countries where there's no such requirement. Uh, and quite often it's just a pay level question if you qualify for any of this, the programs. Uh, many countries see the international study as a way to guarantee that they can uh, increase their inflow of highly skilled. Countries that really are not very attractive globally for highly skilled workers uh, see international study as a way at least getting someone and having a higher chance of retaining them than they would have of simply going and recruiting from abroad. So uh, countries like Korea, Japan, but also uh, Finland and other, other uh, northern European countries see this as a way that you can get a young person in, they learn the language, uh, and, and they stay on. So th this is one of the, the clear benefits that, that underlies this, this facilitation this, uh, for, for stay after graduation. So here is another main mechanism for facilitating students uh, to, to stay after graduation, which is a job search extension. This didn't really exist until really about a decade ago. These, now most countries have them. Uh, if you look at the European directive, uh, it ensures that all countries covered by it have at least a nine month job search extension. Uh, that's already exceeded in most countries. In some cases, for higher education uh, in Australia and Canada, you can stay for years after graduation uh, and work, and work generally unrestricted in the labor market. Uh, in the US, it's zero. But they have this very strange program where the university can sign off on a job saying it's part of your training, and you can stay 12, depending on the field, up to about three years. And this has become an enormous program because all of the other channels have, uh, have blocked. And that makes, I mean, this idea of keeping students really makes sense because uh, highly educated foreigners who come in with a foreign degree have a much more difficult time in the labor market than domestically educated ones. So this is just as an analysis that we did which compares the overqualification rates for the tertiary educated. And you can see that those who studied in the country just do so much better uh, that there is a really strong argument for favoring domestically educated over foreign educated. Another point is in these points-based systems, how much do you weigh the fact that you studied in the country in ranking the highly, edu the highly skilled that you want to retain? So these are uh, countries that have points-based system for attributing residence permits. In most cases, in-country study uh, doesn't count, but if you, you get bonus points for domestic qualifications in, these, in countries like Australia, Austria, Canada, and New Zealand, not in the UK where what really counts is the job and the salary. So uh, to conclude, conclusion one, a few questions that are open, which is now that everyone is promoting these, this international study, uh, can there be too much of a good thing? There can be a, a, a detach, you can have the sales department of the country a bit separate from the migration management department so that the country can be overselling it, it's promoting it uh, and creating unrealistic expectations about study or drawing more applicants than, uh, than, than, than the rest of the ministries would like to see. Uh, what's the role of subsidies? I mean, you think about international education as being an export industry, but if there are a lot of scholarships that changes the calculation. You know? So in Australia, if you don't count the scholarships, it's quite a big export industry, but when you look, many of the students 
who are studying in Australia are actually benefiting from in-country scholarships. So that changes the calculation significantly. And it's something that the higher education industry doesn't always uh, like to take into account when, total, when they announce the total value of these export industry. Uh, internationalization and soft power. I mean, clearly, Alan mentioned this before. This is one of the main motivations for countries that feel like they are outside of the uh, global innovations network, that they would like to have more contact uh, with, uh, with, with young educated people globally. Uh, tertiary studies, it's not quite as internationalized as certain international uh, labor markets. This may be a language effect. Uh, and the last question is, can you really create this very favorable channel for international students without having some kind of effect on the rest of your labor migration system? If you make it very easy for international students to stay after their studies, are you actually taking places away from global talent? And that's relevant in a case where you have caps on total inflows or where it's very difficult to come in as a labor market uh, that you end up basically drawing people in as students and, and sacrificing access to, to some globally mobile talent. So I'll conclude here, but I want to just leave you with a few takeaways. The first, I mean, what is the policy under, what is the assumption, the policy assumption underlying most policy about international students? That they're good, and we heard this also from Alan, we like them, we, we really like these international students. We need to give them some favorable conditions to stay competitive. Uh, we need to let them work while they're in the country. Uh, we need to make it easier for them to stay because otherwise they won't come and other countries are, are, are better. But at the same time, uh, there's an assumption that there's a risk that this could be an illegitimate channel for, well, a channel for, say, backdoor entry through people who don't, who can't, can't actually do high-skilled jobs or who are working during their studies uh, as the main reason for, for their stay rather than uh, studying towards uh, a degree. So I'll close there. Thank you. Lots of food for thought there, especially as um, we're eagerly awaiting a new migration bill in the UK. So lots of policy ideas for us to, to mull over, so thank you, Jonathan. So for our final uh, session this evening, I'd like to welcome Professor Jackie Warber, who will deliver her keynote, International Students' Intentions to Leave the UK, New Evidence on Plans versus Outcomes. And I have to say, when this says new evidence, it really is new evidence, as it's very, very fresh, about two weeks old. So uh, Jackie is a professor of economics at the University of Southampton, and she leads the migration research in the ESRC Centre for Population Change. She's also a member of the UK government's Migration Advisory Committee, and her main research interests are labour economics, development economics, or, but always with a focus on international migration and labour markets. Jackie's published extensively on migration issues and has acted as an academic consultant for many international organisations. Today she's going to be giving you some insights into some really exciting new research. So welcome, Jackie. So let me start by saying I'm really pleased to be here this evening uh, to be presenting really new, fresh results uh, on behalf of you know, the research team at the University of Southampton, especially the Center for Population Change. So I would like to start by giving you some background about the sort of research we are doing, especially talking about the survey we conducted a couple of years ago. So a couple of years ago, ONS approached us to actually conduct a survey on international students, both EU and non-EU, postgraduate and undergraduate, and focus basically on students who were graduating that year to try to understand better whether students are planning to stay or to leave, what sort of travel patterns 
actually happens while they are studying and to try to understand more about international students and whether they work while, for example, they're studying and so on. So we embarked on a very interesting journey. So this was a collaboration between ONS, Universities UK, and CPC. So in the spring of 2017, we actually went and conducted an online survey trying to collect data from students who were graduating, international students who were graduating, and managed to get 3,560 participants from over 130 countries. And as you can see the numbers here for EU versus non-EU, but what was really interesting is that our um, respondents actually were representative of international students, although they were slightly over-representing uh, postgraduate students. But what was really important is that we've also managed to have a very good coverage of universities. So we had Russell groups, we had new universities, we had old universities. So we had a very good sample, representative sample. And what I want to actually um, discuss today are three questions in particular, which I want to focus on using that survey. So I think Alan and Jonathan have done a great job actually giving us the overall sort of macro sort of view of international students. What I'm going to be doing here is asking particular questions and trying to actually show you what students actually thought, um, what, their, what their plans were in terms of to stay or to leave. Why did they come to the UK? Are they planning to you know, um, study or work? Or what are their plans after studying? So the first question, I guess, starting with for universities, the most interesting issue is why do students, international students, choose to study in the UK? And I guess what we find is not surprising at all. So here we have EU and non-EU students. So those were students who were actually enrolled, studying in 2016-17, and they were going to graduate by the summer of 2017. One very reassuring finding is that the majority of students, and students here were actually allowed to give more than one answer, they were saying that they actually came to study in the UK because of the qualification and because of university reputation. Language was also important, culture and life. However, job opportunities did not actually matter as much as we initially thought. Having said that, what was also very interesting given also what Jonathan has said, is that scholarship and funding really also matter for why students choose to actually come to the UK. What we were really interested in finding out in the first wave of the survey was what were students planning to do after they finish. And what we found is that basically most of the students were planning to leave some of them, as you can see, maybe 30 or, you know, or so percent were planning to leave immediately. But what is really important is that we had fund, you know, the findings to support what the exit checks then found you know, um, of August 2017, that most students actually did leave. And when we're looking at our evidence, we find that only 16 percent of students plan to stay um, permanently or to qualify to stay permanently because obviously for non-EU they cannot accept if they qualify to do that. But what was interesting here is that most uh, of our sample did plan to leave, you know, before the end of 12 months. One important question for universities as well is what do international students plan to do after they finish their current studies? And what is really important to focus on here is that the patterns are very similar for EU and non-EU, 
But a lot of students plan to do further studies if they are actually enrolled in undergraduate programs. And some of them, but a small proportion, actually plan to look for a job in the UK in particular. And that was a sort of issue we wanted to find out whether actually students come and want to stay permanently in the UK. Do they actually want to get a job? And our evidence actually showed very similar patterns in terms of EU and non-EU. And also, what we typically find among our you know, British students is that some students also plan to travel after you know, they finish. So it was a very similar sort of pattern. So this was the first uh, wave. And we decided, when we conducted the first wave, to actually ask our international students if they uh, mind us contacting them again once they graduate. And we've managed to actually, after about eight to 11 months later, to conduct a second online survey and follow some of those participants, some of those respondents who were happy for us to contact again. So we managed to actually have 560 roughly participants who replied in the first wave and said they are happy to be contacted again and try to go back and see whether they have actually adhered to their plans or not of staying or leaving and how did they actually manage to do in terms of labor market work and compare EU and non-EU uh, respondents. So the first thing which we found is that basically among our sample here, 71% were already outside the UK. So we're talking about you know, between eight and 11 months afterwards. And 47% were still in the UK. And one of the most important questions we were trying to focus on is basically, do students adhere to their plans? Because we know in the first wave when we asked them whether they wanted to leave or to stay, but we also knew we asked them how certain they were. And about 50% or more were pretty certain of their plans, but obviously not everybody was. So some, you know, uh, some students actually did not have very certain fixed plans. So this is really the new um, results, which we have just sort of um, uncovered very recently. So here we're looking at basically what international students said their intentions were in 2017 in first wave, and looking at their behavior or where they were seven um, or eight, nine uh, months later. So this is basically what we call wave two here. And what you notice straight away is the red column are basically international students who were outside the UK. So those students who plan to leave immediately, 84% of them were already um, living outside the UK when we actually inter interviewed them sort of you know, um, eight months later or in the second wave. And even among students who plan to stay temporarily, which is less than 12 months, about 24% of them also were already outside the UK. And even among students who plan to stay 12 months or more, we do find that around 16% or so also left the UK. So what was very interesting, and especially for people who work on migration, we always worry that migration intentions and plans you know, may or may not materialize. But in the case of international students, we actually find that they do. And one very important and interesting question to ask is whether all international students adhere to their plans or not. And I'm going to show you the difference between EU and non-EU first. And as you can see here, that on the whole, EU and non-EU students adhere and have very similar patterns of leaving the UK after graduating. So it's not only the case that you know, it's non-EU because they cannot stay, but also very similar patterns for EU students. Another important um, 
thing to keep in mind is that it might be the case that it's not only um, EU, non-EU, but it might be differences between undergraduate and postgraduate students which really matter. And to our surprise, what we find is that on the whole, postgraduate students were more likely to leave, even compared to you know, what they initially planned to. So on the whole, postgraduate students were more likely to leave compared to undergraduates, even if they haven't planned to do that. Another um, sort of dimension we've looked at, but there is actually no difference, is gender. So males and females have very similar patterns. So then, probably you might ask, is it the case that they have left, but they're going to come back? And this is really surprising, because we have a question. We ask international students who are outside the UK in the second wave whether they were planning to return. And the main reason for planning to return was basically graduation. Very few plan to come back for work and also very few for studying reason. So, for universities it's very important to think about, you know, what do students do after they finish. Especially employability is one very important indicator for universities. And if we look at our, you know, our sample, so the overall sample here we actually find that, on the whole, only a quarter of our sample were work, working in the UK in the second wave. And it's 30% of EU and 15% of non-EU. Having said that, in terms of absolute size, the size actually is almost um, similar. But what is really interesting is that if we look at what happens to students once they finish, Basically, they are, you know, some of them are studying, some are working, some people are doing other stuff. So now we come to the more sort of sensitive issue. What was the impact of the EU referendum on international students' perception of the UK? And this really was surprising to us. So here we have four dimensions, and the questions were basically looking at you know, the impact of the EU referendum on students' perception of whether the UK has become less attractive place to live in. And as you can see, you know, staggering 92% of EU, our sample of EU students, believes that is the case, but what is surprising is that also a high proportion, 57% of non-EU students felt the same. When it came to, you know, um, whether the EU referendum have affected negatively social cohesion, it's 55% among EU and 53%, you know, uh, among the second group. So basically, there isn't a lot of difference between EU and non-EU when it comes to perception about social co cohesion. However, the only good news in this slide is that basically, when it comes to the value of uh, education, or UK higher education in particular, this is actually was not affected so badly by the EU referendum. So, you know, students still believe that, you know, the UK is an attractive place to study. So, to sum up, I think the evidence overall shows that the vast majority of international students leave after their uh, studies. But what is concerning here is that there is clear evidence that the prospects of the Brexit have affected our sample of students and made the UK less attractive. And this is mainly driven by the uncertainty about policy as well. So to finish, I would like to say that this is basically um, research um, based on you know, uh, our two surveys. So the first survey is available now from ONS, and the data is publicly available, and you can actually you know, ask ONS for 
um, a version of it. And the second wave will be available pretty soon. But also on our website, you will find you know, access to the technical reports and the policy briefs. Thank you. I wonder if I could ask the speakers to come and uh, sit up, and indeed Jane as well. I was going to introduce him, but I was going to introduce him, so. Okay, I'm Ian Diamond. Um, and it's, I'm enormously privileged to be invited to chair the discussion. I, had, I spent 22 wonderful years working with colleagues uh, at Southampton uh, before I went to the Economic and Social Research Council. And I just wanted to say very clearly the quality of the work that Jane is leading at the Centre for Population um, is just unbelievable and is an important resource, I think, for UK demography and for UK social science and indeed for UK policy. So I just think sometimes it's easy to say world leading, but in this case, this group is world leading. I think it's just brilliant. And I'm privileged to be here. And my job is to moderate the discussion uh, some of it will be from you in the audience. Some of it will be tweeting in at 100 miles an hour uh, and the um, people will tell us when uh, there's some tweets and I'll bring those in as well. But before I do anything else, I'm going to invite you to ask any questions. We've heard three, I think, superb uh, presentations which have raised an enormous number of, I think, very important issues. Uh, and so I'm looking forward to hearing uh, from you with questions of anything that you like. Now, who'd like to start? Please, sir. There are roving mics rushing around. And would you mind just telling us who you are before you ask your question? Thank Hello, you. I'm uh, Eduardo from St. George's University of London. Thank you to all panel members for uh, thought-provoking uh, presentations. My question is about uh, one of the most intriguing findings of the Mark report, which is um, the fact that international students may not be progressing to highly skilled employment in the UK. Uh, I was wondering if uh, the panel could put forward a few hypotheses of why this is uh, happening and if there's a, uh, this, this is actually a general trend of all students international and uh, home or if it's uh, something that affects disproportionately um, international students. Thank you. Alan, do you want to kick off? Um, yes. Um, so it disproportionately affects non-EU rather than EU international students, and it disproportionately is there at the master's level rather than undergraduate or PhD. Um, I mean, one of the things we said in the report is we don't quite understand what is going on here, and it's an area where we would like further investigation. Um, there are a number of... Um, you know, hypotheses about it. Um, I think um, part of it is, one hypothesis is connected to if you wanted to co use coming to the UK to study as a path to work and you weren't necessarily able or to get sort of skilled work, you're going to go for a, a one-year master's course. You're not going to want to do a three-year undergraduate. You're certainly not going to want to put yourself through a PhD, even if you could get someone to admit you. So there are some reasons for why when Jonathan talked about education, sometimes perhaps being a, really the people not be, coming on those routes, being more interested in work possibilities than um, study, a one-year master's is the way that you people would like most likely go. Now, why they're being able to earn such low earnings, because on paper, um, they shouldn't be under the UK work migration system, they shouldn't be in the UK earning essentially minimum wage. They might be having, um, uh, not on a work visa, they might be on a family visa, um, they might be, um, you know, there might be other issues about the verification of the incomes on their work visa isn't lined up with information from the tax earnings, information from the tax authorities, which this is. There are a lot of questions. There are more questions than answers, is what I'd say about that at the moment. It is an area where I hope there are people looking at trying to understand it a bit better. Does anyone else want to add anything to that? Jonathan? Yes, uh, just to add, in general, 
you usually, as, as Alan said, when there is a program which is the shortest possible program which grants the, the, the largest possible benefit afterwards, this will attract uh, people who are, who are coming to work. Uh, one of the interesting findings when we've done these country reviews is that international students who work during their employment uh, tend to do better afterwards, uh, depending on the kind of job, if they work in the same field. And what you see is that there are essentially three groups of international students working during their studies. One will work, about a third of them will work a lot, at the maximum or more. Uh, and you suspect that they're really in the country for working. There's a group that will work uh, less, but will work in the field that, they will, that they're studying in, and they tend to have higher income afterwards. Uh, and then there's a group which about half, at least half, who doesn't work at all. Uh, and th so if you, th if you think of that first group that came uh, to work during their studies, quite often they're working in another field. Uh, they're not able to perform very well in their studies, and so they're not well positioned to get a, a high paying job afterwards. Ian, can I just Please, Jane. also add? I just urge some caution around over-interpreting the, um, the finding in the MAC report as showing that the rates of return to um, a, a degree in the UK is not high, which um, it, you could in some respects interpret that because, of course, we're only observing those people who stay in the UK to work. So we're not observing the people who've then returned to their country of origin with their UK qualification and who are uh, in the labour market in their country of origin. So I think uh, we have to be really careful about over-interpreting that data. And as Alan says, we, we need to do more work to understand it. Uh, there are uh, those students, uh, many of them will be on not on work visas, but on family visas. So they may be in part-time work, uh, where their, their partner is in full-time work. They may be thinking about moving into a postgraduate study as well. So it's something that we at the Centre of Population Change have just been talking to. We were actually talking to ONS last week about whether we can do some work with ONS to try and further understand that data. Thank you very much. Next, sir. Uh, Robin Hodgson from the House of Lords. Uh, I wonder if we could look at the other half of the equation. We've talked about the benefit to the country of students coming from overseas. There is, of course, a fixed quantum of availability of undergraduate and postgraduate education. From a UK point of view, and you may say this is too insular and too selfish, there is going to be a disbenefit to the UK if UK members of the settled population, now, whatever, colour or creed, cannot obtain access to the education and therefore cannot fulfil their hopes and their aspirations and also provide the economic benefit that a successful career from someone who grew up in this country would have. Colleagues, I'll pick that up. I might just, 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 you know, just while people are gathering their thoughts, I think it's a very interesting question. Um, I might suggest that at an undergraduate level, the policies enacted by um, the coalition to take the cap off of student numbers in England will, to a large extent, um, have overcome that. And that is not the case in Scotland where the cap still exists and where I think it is a reasonable question in Scotland looking at EU students who can attend Scottish universities without fees in exactly the same way as Scottish students do, um, the extent to which that impacts on opportunities for Scottish students is a reasonable question. But I'm not sure colleagues may disagree with me um, that it is an issue at certainly at the undergraduate level in um, England. Alan, do you have a sense? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think most of our data actually comes from England rather than Scotland. There's no evidence for that at all. In fact, there's evidence of anything of crowding in, which comes from the fact, unsurprisingly, that non-EU students are paying, you know, really very substantially higher fees and hence are essentially cross-subsidising the education of domestic students. So it, the, the notion that there's a fixed number of places um, and inevitably one more for international student means one less domestic student. That isn't the way it is at all, I think. 
and, and as, a, as the dean of a, a faculty, um, I would I would concur with that. That actually the international students is allowing us to recruit more staff to invest in our, our resources and to actually raise the quality of education for the, the UK EU students. So I, I don't recognize that. I think if we were to go back to a time when there was a cap on, on student numbers, then we might find some crowding out. But I agree with Alan, it's mainly crowding in at the present time. Colleagues, sir. Hello, Pep from the University of York. Uh, so as you may know, the UK is a very, the UK higher education system is a very stratified higher education system. Um, Professor Wawa, you mentioned some of the categories, categories we used to classify universities, new, old, and so on. And I wonder if you could give me some uh, an insight of, of your research, uh, bearing in mind those different hierarchical categories. Uh, do you see any differences in terms of students graduating from, from say, Russia Group universities, staying more or going back to the countries more or getting better salaries? I don't know. Thank you. Jackie, do you have a view? Um, yeah, so we, we don't have information here or very good information about salaries, but in terms of patterns, we do find very similar patterns to what you would expect. So basically, you know, postgraduate PGR in particular do very well in terms of uh, participation in the labor market, getting a job, but also they are more likely to get a job outside the UK. So PGR tend to actually, you know, or postgraduate research PhD students tend to do very, uh, very well compared to the others, but undergraduate students as well. And there is a slight bias between Russell Group and non-Russell Group. But we're always very careful because our sample size is not so huge to allow us to actually dig very you know, deep into particular regions or universities. So I would be very careful about you know, making those statements. So one need to be very careful and you know, uh, especially when we're dealing with such a sample size. Alan, did you have a view? Um, not, not really. I mean, I think the point is that the, the ones who are staying for work are disproportionately come from research intensive institutions, so higher up the hierarchy. Although there are a non trivial share that come from institutions that have no, are, are, have no research at all and actually have no ref submission. So it's not that absolutely everybody is like that, but the balance is on that side. Gentlemen here, please. Just, if you just get your microphone. It's uh, John Coles from the Brunswick Group. Uh, you gave a lot of explanations, Alan, as to the contributions that international students provide to the UK. Do we have a quantification in terms of pounds and pence? Um, yes, so I mean, if, um, in, in the report we review a number of, of estimates. Um, there are a number of, I mean, I won't perhaps go into the, the de the de all the details here. I mean, there are different methodologies. I think most of the estimates that are out there are from groups which are trying to sort of big up the, uh, the contribution and probably make some assumptions which I think from our perspective overestimate. So for example, assuming that people like me, if we didn't have international students, would be totally unemployed, um, <laughs> which I like to think um, would not be the case. Um, but I think there's no doubt that the net effect is positive, really. So we didn't actually sort of try and do our best estimate of it. We said, look, it's, it's just very clearly positive. And once you're there, you know, worrying about quite how positive doesn't really matter for policy so much. Jonathan, has OECD put any numbers on these things? No, I think, uh, no. <laughs> no, I, I have I love to a say, straight answer. I have to say that, that I would agree with Alan that there are that generally these estimates are produced by groups who represent the higher education industry, uh, and that they, they often don't take into account some of the, the as I mentioned, scholarships, but also uh, other questions. So, no, we haven't done that. It's, it's quite a complicated exercise. Please, lady there. Um, Stephanie Harris from, from Universities UK. Um, my question really um, is to Alan, but I'd, I'd really welcome other people's views on it. Um, and it's essentially about um, 
the the two reports that, that the MAC were published, and I guess the the synergies or, or lack of synergy between them, um, and essentially whether um, you could comment on um, your recommendations for post-study work option for international students in the UK um, relative to the recommendation in the EA worker report about um, potentially the, you know, the government considering opening up the Tier 5 youth mobility scheme um, for, for lo low-skilled workers um, as a potential option if there is an issue after, after free movement ends. Um, and therefore, I guess, um, whether your report on international students and some of those recommendations around post-study work um, would need to be reconsidered in, in the event of, of, of free movement ending with the European Union. Um, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, obviously there are potentially interactions between these two reports. It's quite, dip I think was one of the challenge right of us writing it is that we don't know, for example, what, you know, we can't make a recommendation for what um, international student regime should be in the event of changes to around EU migration more generally because we don't know what those changes are going to be. Um, and even though, though we're making pro some proposals about it, um, it's, you know, we've no idea whether those are going to be accepted. So I think the international student recommendations should be thought of more about from the status quo, this would what, what would happen. I mean, if there is an expanded youth mobility scheme, I think there's a, a big question is, well, the, the citizens of which countries are eligible for that? Um, so I think, you know, it's quite it's conceivable it's members of the EU. I think it's unlikely that one would have an unrestricted global youth um, mobility scheme because that would attract, I think, very large numbers of um, migrants under that scheme more than probably people think. So it's more likely to be restricted and then it might possibly would be an open to the students from those countries. That would be a possible post-study work route. But I think you'd be, you probably wouldn't go as far as Chinese students as Indian students unless that ended up as part of trade deals with that, which are obviously all, all going to be a long way off. So the trouble is there's so much uncertainty it's very hard to sort of say. Jonathan, did you want to add anything? I, I just wanted to make the note that quite often universities have become the gatekeeper for the whole the entire system. I mean, in, unintentionally, the migration system in many countries has put the university as the, the gatekeeper. So it's no longer the state which decides who comes in, but the university. When you have this two-step migration where most, where some students stay on and those students represent the majority of incoming labor migrants, not the case in, in the UK, but they are a big, a big chunk. In France, they're most of them. In the, in the United States, most uh, people who get the H-1B are, are former students. So these are important channels. That means that the university has become gatekeeper. So I think it's in, it is important to look at international study with other channels, maybe less so international mobility, uh, because the working holiday makers and this kind of uh, temporary stay is not so closely related to permanent to permanent migration, but certainly for other labor migration channels. Thank you, Jackie. Did you want to say anything? Yeah, I think if I might, you know, if I may add, I think I think of the two reports actually as being consistent because, in my view, if we think that we should, we are recommending, you know, removing the cap on tier two and basically students switch from tier four to tier two. It's not you know, up to us to say who's skilled and who's unskilled, but it's the salary threshold which actually determines whether people can you know, get um, a job and stay or not. So in my view, it's actually more consistent, the two uh, reports, than you know, if you're just looking at international students' recommendations only and you know, the EA report recommendations only. So they're both consistent. Thank you very much. University of Southampton. Um, Alan, you, you mentioned that there is a crash in the further education um, numbers. And the question for you is, why is that? And has that any implications to the higher education numbers and so forth? And I wonder if the OECD already did some work on the uh, further education sector as well. Um. Yes, so I mean, I think the, um, the, the boom, you know, because to have the bust, you had to first have the boom, um, came from the introduction of the tier four system. 
that allowed um, a lot of new institutions in to enter into the UK, which were these institutions that sort of Jonathan referred to that in UK parlance would re be referred to as bogus colleges in, in inverted commas often. Um, so they expanded hugely um, and the suspicion is that many of their students were really coming to work. It corresponded to a period in which uh, there was a very generous post-study work regime. There was also a highly skilled migrant visa, which just looked at paper qualifications of, um, of, of students. Uh, but actually, when you looked at the work they were doing, they often weren't doing highly skilled work. Um, and that, was, that, those, that constellation led to the, the boom. And then the bust was when the, was the new government as well came in and basically said, we, you know, we've got to worry about the problems that, you know, have occurred in many countries about abuse and so on, that we need to sort of worry about this has got a bit out of, this has got out of control. Um, spillovers onto the HE sector. I think the one area place where people say there might have been effect is many of the students in the FE sector were coming from the Indian subcontinent, actually. And this suddenly created an image that um, it was becoming very difficult to move to the UK to study. And even though that wasn't really true for the AG sector, it, there's a sort of split, spillover. That's a sort of perhaps a subtle distinction, a rather too subtle distinction, if you're, for example, in India thinking about studying here. So one of the hypotheses for why the UK began to struggle with the Indian market for higher education is because the, the, the because of that crash in FE numbers, which would be a large number, high proportion of which had actually been Indian students. Thank you very much. Jonathan, did you want to add anything on FE? I think that it, what, uh, what Alan described is, is very similar to what's going on in many countries. Uh, this kind of proliferation of, of language schools in particular is often associated with uh, a cycle of crackdowns and expansion. So that's... Uh, Thank you. Sir. Uh, David Glarney, Middlesex University and University of Southampton alumnus. Um, the discussion so far obviously has been quite focused on the benefits of international students to the UK. Uh, but if there is an assumption that the, the UK should either maintain or grow the share of international students that we have here globally, then I suppose we also have to think about the benefit to the international student and to the countries they're coming from. So given the experts here today, I suppose I'd just be interested to hear what analysis, what research there is to show whether international students who come to the UK get something beneficial above what other countries can provide for international students, and if the countries they go back to can see the benefit they're getting having come to the UK? It's a great question with a difficult answer. Alan, mm -hmm. have you got one? Jonathan, Jane, Jackie. <laughs> <laughs> Well, your return migration, you can yes. So I think there is actually a, a substantial literature, not necessarily focusing on international students in particular, but basically focusing on migrants and once they return home, what do they sort of bring with them? But focusing on education in particular, there is actually a very well-known paper which looks at where democratic leaders were educated and actually find a you know, uh, correlation between studying in a democratic country and actually going back home and becoming more democratic. So this is probably the most well-known paper in the literature focusing on education. But you know, there are actually um, many papers showing that migrants in general, when they return, they return back and they have norms, whether those norms are of very similar sort of gender norms or consumption patterns or, or political norms to where they actually lived for a period of time. Um, and the bottom line is basically where um, migrants go they absorb the norms. So if they go to democratic countries where gender norms are maybe uh, better or you know, are uh, less conservative, then they go back and you know, have very similar uh, norms. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, Peter Lilly, House of Lords. International students are undoubtedly a, a great uh, boon to the economy and to the university sector in that they're subsidizing the non-international students. EU students, however, uh, have access to UK loans. Um, and 
when last I looked, uh, far fewer of them repaid that loans, and presumably it's very difficult to enforce the repayment of loans once they return back to their home countries. However, presumably post-Brexit, they will become international students, and if they still come, they will be a great boon to the rest of the economy if they're paying the full fees. Do you have any sense as to whether they will come in the same numbers, will be prepared to pay, pay the fees, which the interesting thing was you, your study seemed to suggest that the market was quite insensitive to the fees. And I'd be interested in that. Oh, um, so I'll say a bit about um, student loans first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think the statistics on, re I mean, repayment rates of all students, actually, domestic and international, are, are low. These are not money-making loans. These are money-losing loans, um, even with interest rates of 6%, you know, way above market interest rates. Um, I think on the international students, um, the fraction who are repaying is, is lower, EU students, um, particularly the ones who are no longer in the UK because you know, we can't get to them through PAYE. But it's a, there are some other things on the other side. The ones who do remain are actually paying back more because they're going into higher paid jobs than the average domestic undergraduate. So I think the figures on you know, net repayment rates are, um, are, not, you know, are not perfect, actually. And it's quite hard to extract from the statistics. But everybody is under what, you know, nobody is repaying. I mean, not obviously individuals are repaying, but it's certainly the government is spending money on student loans. Um, so, I mean, that is a thing. But I think if you quantified it, you wouldn't find it's in the big scheme of things so much. I mean, EU students aren't eligible for loans for maintenance. They're only for tuition. Where, so the average loan taken out is also rather uh, smaller. I mean, I think on the... Um, I think there's some evidence that student enrolments is sensitive to, uh, to fees. Um, I, my understanding is that it will be up to institutions um, to set fees for EU and non-EU students that if they wanted to, you know, they can continue to um, charge different fees. So it will then be, um, I have no idea whether they will be. I mean, I, th I think that's a, a view that, I think our view is that's a matter for the institutions themselves. But probably it's the case that if they raised fees, there would be a smaller number of non, of, there would be a smaller number of EU students. Um, whether that smaller number offsets the higher fees so total revenue goes up or down is a bit more uncertain. I don't know whether you have views on Well, I think the only thing is that recently the ESRC have actually changed their funding rules. So they don't fund, for example, as many uh, non-UK students as they used to. And we definitely at university level have seen a drop in the number, but I don't know to what extent this is sort of, uh, you know, everywhere else. But this is basically based on a very particular group funded by the yeah. ESRC. The number of students has been going up. And the only yes. point I would make, if I may, is um, the evidence I'm about to give is totally anecdotal, i.e., the vice chancellors I talk to, um, but m those that I speak to would say that a significant number of their EU students do not take advantage of the loan facility. So that I would submit there is a market out there, but I would also submit, as Alan has said, that it will be sensitive to the fees that people charge. I, I think I would also just say that we need to uh, differentiate our markets. So between undergraduate and PGT and PGR, and I, I suspect that the undergraduate market may well contract, um, but I don't see that there will be much change in the, post, the, the PGT market. The uh, UK has something going for it. We have a, you can get a master's in one year, whereas the rest of Europe is two years. Um, that remains an attractive proposition. And of course, uh, that's not... Um, and that's not affected by um, the loans. Uh, and we already have institutions that are charging differential fees 
both for UK and EU students at master's level. So we have institutions that charge premium fees. I think we've got a member of one at the table here, Alan. Yes. My old alma mater as well. So. I'd like, can I just, I, two points. The first is that there is a, an important effect. You can see this when there are, are big exchange rate shifts. And that's when you really see to what extent a country is being seen uh, in terms of cost. In Australia, when the Australian dollar became more, rose, they saw a sharp decline in international study, especially from India. Uh, the second example is Sweden, which had no fees for non-EU students. They introduced them, and their non-EU student population plummeted from one year to the next. So those are examples of countries where clearly cost was a consideration. So I don't know what the answer is for the UK, but there are plenty of examples that uh, a large part of the market is sensitive to that. Sir. Uh, Nick Tolchard from Invesco Asset Management. Um, one of the other strong educational exports of the UK is its professional qualifications. Um, and we see a huge uptake of people uh, around the world who take UK qualifications. Um, have you managed to track whether a number of these graduates that go back into country are then following up by taking UK qualifications whilst they're in country, so we're still exporting something to them? I, I think a brief answer would be no, I'm afraid. I'm, I, I mean, it, it would be perhaps interesting, but I think our ability to sort of track people, particularly once they leave the UK, is extremely, I extremely limited. Um, so I don't know. I wonder if I could just uh, ask a question that's been worrying me. We've talked all the time about international students. And one of the stratifications that I think is interesting is by subject. You know, many people say that there's a big push into business schools. But I didn't know whether anyone wanted to comment on if you like, trends that may be by the subject that people study or future opportunities by subject of study? Um, I think we don't have, we don't have in, in our report so much about trends. We do have the snapshot of what's yeah. happening now. And it is that disproportionately you would see international students um, studying sort of STEM subjects, um, you know, engineering, IT, these kind of things particularly, um, and sort of business management, you know, even econ you know, economics kind of subject. That's where the bulk of the students are. You've got very, really quite small numbers doing <coughs> humanities mm -hmm. um, and those things. And finance as well. And finance, and finance and business yeah. related. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right, now then, is there one last question? Because I've got a hard ending in just a few minutes. So please, sir. <coughs> Uh, Gavin Costigan, University of Southampton. Um, are we over-dependent on students from China? And is there a problem if that market substantially changes? Uh, well, <laughs> it's a I question think many <laughs> universities worry about. Many Gavin. universities worry about. I mean, I'm just going back to the, the slides, actually, that Alan, I think, put up, or was it Jonathan, put up uh, that showed how important China is for, for the UK. China's a very important market. I think all universities at the moment are uh, trying to diversify their international student um, population. That's not to reduce the number of Chinese students, but actually to increase the, the number of international students from, from other origin countries. Uh, I, somebody in the audience mentioned about the experience of the international students. I think that was, was David himself. And I think that's actually very important. A lot of the Chinese students who come to the UK come because they want an international experience. They don't actually come to study with other Chinese students, but that's what they find when they get here. I have a PhD student at the moment who is looking at the experience of Chinese students during their studies. Uh, they want to come, they want to integrate. Uh, we need to do better in terms of the experience that we give them while they're here, but we also need to, to diversify. So we're all anxiously making trips um, to India and other parts around the world. If you go to India now, you'll fall over other vice chancellors <laughs> and other deans as we all tour around 
um, the, the major institutions. And I, I might just say, for those of us who are old enough to remember the early 1980s in higher education, at that time there was a push around American junior year abroad mm. students, and many came. And after a few years it was clear that too many universities were just having courses full of American junior year abroad students who didn't want to be sitting next to someone from the next state. They wanted to have an international experience and a number of universities I know did have you know, lost uh, students for that reason. So I do think it's, it's a really important question, Gavin. Yeah, I mean, I think that it, it, it is a big risk because it's not just the numbers, it's that the Chinese government more has much more central control over you know whether its students go to this country or that country than for example india you know india would have and so if someone did something so crazy as to start a trade war with china which obviously is not something that anybody would think about um you know one of the ways in which china could quite easily um you know respond to that would be to say well we're going to send all our students not to your country but to some of these other countries um, we, we would benefit from, no, I think the unit, I'm not sure you would feel you would benefit from that. Vis-a-vis America. Oh, vis-a-vis -vis America, yes, but I mean, I think you can see the impact that probably, I mean, I'm not sure what Jonathan's view on this, but I think the environment in, in the US is probably not helping their enrollment of international students. I don't know if you think that's fair. Yeah, at the moment, and, and to some extent will be a beneficiary of that. Uh, colleagues, thank you very much. I'd like to do two things. Firstly, I'd like to thank our four panel members for answering uh, those questions so incredibly wisely uh, and uh, with great enthusiasm. And secondly, I'd like to thank all of you for participating so fully and making sure that the quality of the questions was so high. So on all of your behalfs, thank you very, very much. And shall we thank the panel and thank yourselves in the usual way. And I'd just like to thank Sir Ian for chairing us so, so well. Um, as I mentioned during my introduction, this is the first lecture in our 2018 public lecture series, uh, which is focusing on population and migration. We have two further exciting lectures in November and December. On the 20th of November, please do join us if you can to discuss the uncertainty and complexity of migration. Around the globe, People choose to move for many reasons. Some choose to seek new opportunities, education, which we've been talking about today, whilst for others it may be a bid to escape poverty or war. Migration can impact on economies and societies, trigger policy responses, and promote political debate. It's truly a global challenge that affects all societies and one in which we need to adapt, accept, and to manage. Chaired by Alumus alumnus Jason Cowley, who's the editor of The New Statesman. At our next lecture, our keynote speakers will be Professor Jakob Bijak, who's a professor of statistical demography at Southampton, and John Simmons, the deputy director for analysis on migration and border policy at the Home Office. And an information leaflet on the other lectures can be found at the registration desk as you go up, and also online by searching for Southampton Public Lectures. So may I thank uh, the panel members again and all of the guests for attending and just invite you all to join us for a drinks reception in the Marshall Room, uh, uh, the Marshall of the Cambridge Room, sorry, Marshall of Cambridge Room. This is all very military. I'm not, not used to the terminology. Marshall of Cambridge Room upstairs where you came in. But thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.